Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now is Corey Pine. He is the author of Live, Work, 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 Die, A Journey into the Savage Heart of Silicon Valley. Corey, thanks for being here. Always happy to be on the Majority Report. Always great to have you on whatever show I'm hosting, Corey. Um, this is a great book. It's very timely. I feel like you picked a moment when pretty much unless you're sort of just totally deluded, uh, you're skeptical about Silicon Valley. But how did this process start? You actually moved there and tried to create a tech entrepreneur lifestyle for yourself. How did that, what was yeah. the inspiration behind that? And how well, did that work you know, out? I, I talk about in the introduction, I was something of a true believer before I started this book. I mean, I was a newspaper journalist for years and just what, you know, getting laid off and during pay cuts, all of that shit. And, you know, I thought that the tech industry looked pretty good by comparison. This is, I'm talking back, you know, to post 2008, 2010. Um, I, I, I think it was 2010. I decided to leave my newspaper job and launch a startup of my own. It was called War is Business. And the idea was that it was a uh, defense contracting watchdog site. And the buzzword at that time was crowdsourcing. So it was going to be crowdsourced. Um, And of course, I wound up being the only person that really contributed anything to it. Uh, But I learned uh, some stuff before I burned out, like many solo entrepreneurs do. Um, about how uh, Google exerts its monopoly influence in the market and about the sort of uh, cult-like motivational propaganda that exists to egg on people who want to start tech companies, you know, and, and make it big in tech. And I was kind of, I really actually <clears throat> did buy into a lot of that stuff. I was reading Hacker News every day, yeah. teaching myself how to code and doing all of, uh, basically doing what the standard advice uh, was back in that period. Um, so anyway, I burned out after about a year of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sometime later took a job at a proper startup that somebody else had founded in London that had you know, investors in beanbag chairs and, oh, you know, an, a lo- an so that's serious <laughs> yeah. stuff. The beanbag exactly. broke out. Okay. So exactly. there's some real ideation an, going on here. And an espresso. Oh, uh, wow. yeah. So it was a real startup. Anyway, uh, it got acquired as many startups are. Uh, they called it a successful uh, exit, you know, for the founders. And, um, I stuck around for the aftermath and realized that when, uh, when a company gets sold, it's always bad for the company. And it's always portrayed as a, uh, as a good thing for everyone involved, but it was the opposite. I mean, you know, we were, it was a news startup and the new owners, it was Bill Gates, actually, uh, one of his companies, uh, immediately wanted to do like a 50% staff cut. And I ended up resigning because I thought that would put some of our people in danger because we had people in like Syria, right. uh, all kinds of places where they were at risk and we needed, we needed fully staffed to be fully staffed so that there were no periods when so if somebody got in trouble on a story, there would be nobody around to help or make a call for them or whatever right. needed to happen. Anyway, so I went through a couple of really disillusioning experiences about the tech industry and was then kind of unemployed for a while. Not sure if I'd, what, what I would be doing next, if I'd be going back to journalism or if that would even be possible, um, after quitting an editor in chief job after six months. So I wound up, uh, you know, kind of hanging out in my pajamas and getting bitter for a while and then started writing about, um, uh, to sort of taking it out on the tech industry, started freelancing again, uh, writing some articles that were kind of cathartic uh, about how 
you know, this idea of entrepreneurial journalism was BS right. and how there was a real sort of creepy uh, sort of fascist undercurrent in the tech scene. And that led to the book deal. So the original concept for the book, the original title was How to Make $30 Billion the Silicon Valley Way. Yeah. And <laughs> which uh, <laughs> let's do it as a follow up book still a good title well no uh you know the title kind of served its purpose because um i decided that if i were really going to write about the tech industry i needed to go to the heart of it i couldn't just you know report from my couch as comfortable as that might be um <laughs> so i went and i told everybody i met in the bay area and silicon valley that i was working on a book about how to get rich in tech but also that i was uh trying to uh, secure funding for a startup of my own. And, and that's sort of the narrative premise of the book. And so you found a couple of different things here. Uh, one was that the sort of, even the idea, and if we take as a given that, of course, from the beginning, that uh, we talked about this on, on, uh, on my show, um, but we could expand on it here and, 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 and still use the same kind of framework. In a way, you're doing a history, in my view, of a Silicon Valley is this sort of like hyper condensed history of capital, basically, because um, you you sort of have a public good that's generated as a commons. It's government funded research. It's created through academic communities, amateur communities, also private sector activity, but stuff that's totally interdependent and inseparable from government investment community networks. Then. It's privatized. That's like the primitive accumulation where you turn a commons into a private asset and then people just eat off of it. And, you know, even these ideas, like it's very funny. I mean, we'll, we'll get to Elon Musk in a bit, but one of the most sort of hysterical responses you get from his cultists that really prove that he's a, just a certified genius is that in the 1990s, the idea occurred to him, as it probably would occur to like literally any like 14-year-old, that at some point people are going to buy stuff over this new thing called the internet. In fact, it's probably mostly what they'll use the internet for. And therefore, you should create a platform to process people's credit card information or even skip credit cards altogether if possible, right, for like online banking activities. Now, to get the money, the investment, the wherewithal to actually do that, of course, that takes something. But like the basic concept is totally obvious. But there was a time when... If you had the right connections, theoretically, you could go to Silicon Valley maybe and have that kind of story. Okay, I'm the guy who's doing uh, pet food online or whatever. By the time you get to the Valley, the, even those sort of like pockets of openness are gone. So what's actually happening in the startup community? But still, there's a rush of young people going there with fantasies of being the next jobs uh, you know, Bezos or Musk. So what's the reality that they're actually finding when they get there? Uh, <clears throat> overcrowded slum, like Airbnbs and, uh, jobs that allow very little personal autonomy and seem to make everyone miserable. I mean, the burnout that I experienced, um, as sort of a one man band running a website, um, is, not limited to that. I mean, it, it also applies to the, the kind of software engineer, marketing jobs, whatever that that right. people are flocking to Silicon Valley to take. Uh, and, you know, I, most of my reporting uh, was done in, in 2015, the on the ground stuff, although there's more up to date information in the book than that. Um, and e that still looking back looks more like the salad days than now. Uh, when a lot of the easy easy money has, uh, has dried up. So it's, uh, you know, to quote, uh, star Wars meme, you know, it's a trap. Don't go. Uh, in, in fact, people are leaving in droves. They're coming to cities like Portland where I live now and telecommuting if their employers will allow it, which, uh, many increasingly do because the housing costs have gotten so out of control. Uh, it, it, it's really, uh, the, the tech bubble has, has ruined San Francisco and, and some of the book, is about that sort of a, a lament uh, for the city.
what and, was, and people have really picked up on that aspect of it as well. Definitely. We'll get to that uh, more. What, what, where was the easy money going? And if those were the salad days, what's going on now from particularly cause yeah, like the reality is, is that most of these jobs and in, of course, relatively speaking, these are relatively privileged jobs to other part of the con of the economy by and large, but yes, people are overworked. I don't know. What are they like content ninjas or, you know, coding wizards or all this other nonsense they work in marketing and coding for big conglomerates where they have to work all the time but there's still an idea that you can go there and strike it rich and get you know some type of breakthrough you well, said, yeah so what what's actually like going from the entrepreneurial end from that perspective like where is the money going how does one get that money uh and what does it look like even yeah relative to today versus 2015 well, step one, get admitted to Stanford as an undergrad. <laughs> right. That's really the the main thing. I assumed that my connections, I mean, I went to a state school and an Ivy League for graduate school, and I assumed that my connections would be enough to sort of open doors there, and uh, and typically they weren't. Um, the the culture around uh, Stanford, which is really sort of the, the heart and the, the brain of Silicon Valley uh, is really one that that pushes uh, its young engineering and business graduates out as soon as possible. Sometimes with the uh, encouragement of administrators and faculty to drop this whole thing about dropping out and and making it big. I mean, that's actually encouraged in some of these departments right. um, because <clears throat> they all know, know that it's it's the money uh, that matters at the end of the day, not the the education right. that they're supposedly getting so the net the network is number one uh they're going uh, as far as the ideas uh the kinds of companies that get funded um it, it tends it changes over time right now ai is the big thing right. when i was there it was the internet of things uh there have been a couple of previous um iterations i mean i mentioned crowdsourcing which sounds like ancient history right but uh, there's something new every six months, and the trick is just to take what you've whatever you've got, and figure out how to slap the right buzzword on it uh, to to ride the wave at the moment. So right now, I, as far as my information has it, the the thing is still AI. So you see a lot of companies, and I heard this from a former AI engineer at Google. Actually, yeah. a lot of the startups, the AI startups that are getting funded now, are basically run uh, on Amazon. Mechanical Turk, which is a service where you can hire people to do uh, very simple tasks like filling out captchas right. online to uh, for pennies or e even in some cases I think fractions of pennies. Uh, so the the AI uh, revolution is probably some like wage slave in a Bangladeshi like click factory. Um, right. Th that <laughs> of course. So, that's an example of the kind of stuff that goes on. So I was pitching startups that seemed a little bit. Yeah, let's get to uh, that. What I, startups were you okay. pitching and what was the ultimate?